Hello, on behalf of the Historical Society of Harford County, welcome to this virtual event in three parts, Divided Union, Harford County in the Civil War. The Historical Society of Harford County Incorporated, established at the County Courthouse in 1885, is the oldest county historical society in Maryland. The Historical Society collects, preserves, promotes, and interprets the rich and diverse history of the Harford County area in its regional context from prehistoric origins to the present for the education and enjoyment of current and future generations. The Society's headquarters at 145 North Main Street in Bel Air, Maryland, houses extensive collections of court records, artifacts, photos, books, newspapers, portraits, articles, and written materials by and about the people and places of Harvard County. The Society also operates the 1788 Hayes House Museum in the oldest home within the Bel Air, Maryland town limits. The Hayes House is a living history museum and a valuable educational resource that illustrates and recreates the social and cultural aspects of daily life of the rural gentry in the formative years of our country. Unfortunately, both the Hayes House and the headquarters building are closed to the public at least through the end of 2020 to help halt the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic. In the meantime, you can become a member, request research, and browse a portion of our collection on the Society's website, www.harfordhistory.org. This presentation is the first of two presentations chronicling the role of Harford County and her people during the Civil War. This episode focuses on the years 1860 to 1862. Following the release of the second presentation, you will have the opportunity to join the presenter in a virtual live question and answer session on October 13, 2020. More on that later. The presenter is Jeffrey K. Smart, a longtime member of the Historical Society and a retired U.S. Army historian who specializes in military history. He holds both bachelor's and master's degrees in history from San Jose State University in San Jose, California. He served as the editor of the Harford Historical Bulletin from 1993 to 2003 and has written eight bulletin articles. He resides with his wife Paige in Bel Air, Maryland. Now let us begin. This will be a presentation on the history of Harford County in the Civil War, 1861 to 1865. I call it a divided union. It will be in two parts. Uh, part one will be from 1860 to 1862. First, I want to discuss a little bit about what Harford County looked like in uh, 1860. This is a map of Harford County in approximately the 1860s. Harford County was strategically located in the whole country because it was between the northern states and the southern states. And because of that, some of the key sites in Harford County became important for the war effort. The Conowingo Bridge was the only bridge in Harford County across the Susquehanna River. It could be used for pedestrian traffic and uh, wagons and even herds of cattle would cross that bridge. Cavity Grace was the largest city in Harford County with about 1,900 citizens. But because there was no railroad bridge or pedestrian bridge at Haverty Grace, train cars had to be loaded onto the ferry boat Maryland and taken across the Susquehanna River and then put back on the tracks in Haverty Grace. The Philadelphia, Wilmington, and Baltimore Railroad was the main north-south railroad uh, in the United States at the time. So the traffic was very, very important to carrying supplies and troops down to uh, Baltimore and to Washington, D.C. during the war. There were two key river bridges 
in Harford County, the Bush River Bridge and the Gunpowder River Bridge. These were wooden bridges. Uh, you can see kind of what they look like in the, in the pictures. But they were strategically important uh, because all you had to do was knock out one of those bridges and the entire railroad line would be blocked. Of course, Baltimore, which was not in Harford County, but nearby, is the largest city uh, by far in uh, Maryland. And that was a very important location for uh, the Union war effort. Bel Air itself uh, was only about 200 citizens at the time, but it was the county seat. And you can see the county courthouse, uh, what it looked like at the time. There was also the Northern Central Railroad uh, which was not in Harford County, but went from Baltimore up toward Harrisburg. And that was a key uh, railroad also that could be used as an alternative to the uh, PWP, as it was called. This is a chart uh, from the uh, 1860 census that shows the nature of the people of Harford County. As you can see, um, over 17,000 971 people identified as white on the 1860 census. 5,444 identified themselves as African Americans. Those were broken down further to uh, 3,644 were free African Americans and 1,800 were slaves. And of those uh, 1,800 slaves, they were owned by about 657 slave owners. That number is, is, can be debated, and there's various versions of it. But you can see only a small portion of Harford Countyans own slaves. And if you compare the number of slaves in Harford County to the total number in Maryland of 87,189, you can see that most of the slaves in Maryland were in the southern counties of Maryland, not up in Harford County. Because Harford County was strategically located near Pennsylvania in the north, uh, it did have an active underground railroad to uh, help uh, slaves escape uh, southern bondage. Initially, most of them tried to go through Havre de Grace uh, following the railroad lines. But as the uh, rules became stricter on who could ride those trains and uh, how to get across the Susquehanna River, uh, the underground railroad uh, moved north of, of Havre Grace, more so um, by the time of the Civil War. So along comes 1861, a uh, very critical year in what happens to um, Harford County. First off, we had a new president. Uh, President-elect Abraham Lincoln came through um, Harford County. He was supposed to be on his way to Washington, D.C., but there were some reports of a possible plot to assassinate him. And so he changed his route, and instead of coming down that uh, Northern Central Railroad from Harrisburg, he, he passed through uh, somewhat quietly through uh, to Harford County uh, to Baltimore and eventually made it safely on to uh, Washington, D.C. for his inauguration in March 4th. But you can see some of these uh, cartoon drawings of uh, imagination about how Lincoln disguised himself to pass through uh, Harford County. Shortly after President Lincoln's inauguration, the Confederacy attacked Union-held Fort Sumter in South Carolina on April 12th. After a brief battle on April 13th, Fort Sumter surrendered. This was the beginning of military operations of the Civil War. As a result of that surrender, on April 15th, President Lincoln called for 75,000 volunteers to suppress the rebellion. Those troops that he called for, particularly from the north, had to pass along the two railroad lines, and they had to pass through Baltimore. On April 19th, 1861, there was a riot against those troops in Baltimore. That resulted in four soldiers killed, 12 civilians killed, 
and the citizen leaders of Baltimore made the decision to burn the bridges north of the city to prevent further troops coming in to Baltimore. To do that, they uh, sent uh, uh, civilians under the leadership of Isaac R. Trimble up uh, to the, the two railroads, and particularly one we're concerned with is they burned the Gunpowder River Bridge and the Bush River Bridge. The drawing there shows what the burning of the Gunpowder Bridge may have looked like. This effectively stopped the Union troops from using the railroad lines from the north. And as you can see on this chart, the uh, troops trying to come down from Harrisburg were blocked, and the troops at Perryville were blocked, creating kind of a stalemate. Troops, Union troops from uh, Washington area moved up south of Baltimore, uh, which was defended by a volunteer ununiformed corps under Isaac Tremble briefly. Although the two railroad bridges in Harford County were burned, apparently on April 25th, local citizens from Harford County burn the Bush River Bridge again. Now keep in mind though, the burning of a bridge did not destroy the whole bridge. It just destroyed a section of the bridge. So it could be easily repaired, but the railroad did not want to go into a hostile area to repair the bridges. Now one of the people I want to track as we go through the history of Harford County is a civilian. Her name was Priscilla Stump Griffith. She lived uh, just south of Hall's Crossroads, which is Aberdeen today. She was about 46, and she wrote minute writing in diaries uh, and talked about everything that was going on. So, for example, on May 8, 1861, Priscilla wrote, Every appearance of war staring us in the face, Maryland will be the battleground. Should be also noted that her husband, John L. Griffith, was a farmer and a slave owner, too. May 9th, the next day, Union soldiers were sent into Harford County. This allowed the railroad to go in and repair the two bridges that were burned, the Bush River and the Gunpowder Bridge. At the same time, Union troops moved into Baltimore and occupied Baltimore throughout the rest of the war. The first train came through from Philadelphia to Baltimore on May 13, 1861. Now, not everyone in Harford County was happy with what was going on, particularly they didn't like the Lincoln administration. They didn't like Union troops in uh, Harford County and around Baltimore. So, for example, the Friends of Peace and States' Rights held a meeting June 15th in 1861. Uh, you can see here one of the people involved in that was John Carroll Walsh, who was the editor of the Aegis. The results of the meeting included they criticized the war effort, they stressed war would prove disastrous to both sides and would alienate South permanently. They urged recognition of the Confederacy. They expressed sympathy for those wanting to take Maryland out of the Union. One of the things that the Union troops in Maryland at that time uh, did was to try to suppress rebellion throughout the state. As for Bel Air, that involved about 300 soldiers marching uh, overland from Whitehall to Bel Air. They initially surrounded the city, blocked off the exits, and then deployed most of their troops around the courthouse. Now, in 1861, Bel Air had two newspapers. The National American was extremely pro-Union. The Aegis, which had different names uh, at the time, but always had the word Aegis in it, uh, was definitely pro-Southern. And when the Aegis reported about the Union troops uh, milling about the courthouse. They described them as half-starved, ill-clad, woe-begone-looking wretches carrying many muskets. Now, the Union troops seemed to have arrested only two people. One was Archer Jarrett, who was a lawyer and 
uh, one of the leaders of the Harford Light Dragoons, which was a militia unit being organized around Bel Air, and Henry uh, de Fernandez, who was a lawyer and war opponent. And that was about it. Uh, they, they didn't find any uh, weapons that they thought they would be able to find uh, in Bel Air and could convince no one to uh, tell them where any of the weapons were. One of the people in Bel Air who escaped, though, was Herman Stump. Herman Stump was the brother of Priscilla Stump Griffith. He was a lieutenant colonel of the militia. He had a law office uh, under the old Odd Fellows Hall. Union troops offered a $10 award for his capture, but according to Stump, written many years after the war, was that he spent the night at the home of a young lady friend on Thomas Run. And there he was alerted by none other than John Wilkes Booth of the danger of his arrest. He ended up fleeing to Canada and uh, claimed after the war that most of the militia weapons uh, that the Union troops were looking for were buried in a field in the Priestford area. And farmers there would occasionally turn up weapons uh, after the war. In the midst of all this going on in Maryland, was the gubernatorial election of 1861. There was really no Republican Party in Maryland at this time, and the Democratic Party basically split into two branches. The Union Party favored supporting the Lincoln administration and retaining the, the Union. The Southern or Peace Party favored uh, not pursuing the war and favored supporting the South. Now, to have this uh, election in the middle of a war, there was many issues that came up. For example, Mrs. Griffith complained about the issue of slavery, that the free Negroes around lived off the farmers, never work when they can steal enough, and the slaves are almost ruined by them. The Union commanding officer of the Union forces in Maryland at the time, Major General Don Dix, stressed that he was working for a government that uh, belonged to the Constitution, which allowed slavery, as, as did Maryland allow slavery. And he wrote, we would not meddle with the slaves, even of secessionists. We have nothing to do with slaves. We are neither Negro stealers nor Negro catchers and that we should send them away if they come to us. The other issue was voting rights. And General Dix stated, I have this day issued an order to arrest any persons who have been in arms in Virginia if they appear at the polls and attempt to vote. Now what he was referring to is that because Maryland did not succeed from the Union and remained part of the Union, Many of the pro-Southern sympathizers went south and joined military forces in Virginia. And the, the concern was that those people would come back to, for example, Harford County and try to vote down uh, the Union Party. Now, Mrs. Griffith's version of that is, no one is safe, male or female, who's bold enough to express opposition to the Lincoln administration. Such tyranny is unheard of in civilized countries. And the idea of an election in our degraded state is a farce. The election results in Harford County, November 6, 1861, show that Bradford is elected uh, governor. He, he won the, the total. Uh, however, as you can see there, Abington, the, uh, the first district in Harford County, uh, went with Howard. And you can see the numbers were not even twice as much for the voting for the Union and those opposed or voting for the Peace Party. The new Maryland governor, Augustus W. Bradford, was a Harford Countyan. He was born in Bel Air, attended Harford Academy, about age 57. He was a member of the Union Party, which was a new party that was uh, started during the uh, beginning of the Civil War. His inauguration was January 8, 1862. 
And as kind of a statement of how he thought about the ongoing war, he said, if there is anything connected with secession more grossly fallacious than its claim to be considered a constitutional right, it is, especially so far as Maryland is concerned, its adaptation as a remedy for existing evils. There are many opinions about the election. Of course, the Aegis, being the southern side of the opinion, noted that in Havity Grace, the Union Party received more majority by far than their illegal voters residing there, implying that some of the Union troops occupying Havity Grace may have voted also. The Baltimore Sun, which did support the, um, the Union Party, uh, simply remarked that Harford County is all right for the Union. Mrs. Griffith, however, her comment was, oh, if war only over and the Southern Confederacy established. So 1861 was a rough time for Maryland and Harford County. 1862 comes along. And Harford Countyans had gone down south to join uh, Virginia units. And one of them from Harford County was James J. Archer. He was in the military, the U.S. military, at the beginning of the Civil War and ended up in commanding a Texas infantry regiment initially. And some of his opinions about what was going on in Maryland and Harford County are quite interesting. For example, January 8, 1862, he wrote a letter to his brother saying, our Maryland is throttled every day I see her across the Potomac. The armed heel of the disgusting despot trampling upon her bosom. I see no chance to re relieve her or avenge her. Now, he, he continued to write to his sister, Nanny, who was in Hartford County, and had some issues because it began to be complicated to how they could exchange messages. So he wrote, I am told that the legislature of Maryland has passed a law to punish with fine and imprisonment not only those who write to, but all who receive letters from rebels. That being the case, I suppose the rebels will cease to write their friends in Maryland, especially to those who have any property to confiscate, and will not expect their friends to write to them. And when they do happen to receive a letter, they will not acknowledge its receipt or at least from whom it came. So that became a real issue. Another Hartford County in the Confederate Army was William R. Bazell. He had gone down to Virginia and joined the 8th Virginia Infantry Regiment, where he was elected captain of Company A. And you can see on the map there, Bel Air, you can see Bazell's Gover Hotel uh, that he um, ran, and his family was still there. Harford counties also joined in the Union Army, not just the, the Confederate forces, but because uh, Harford County did not have enough soldiers available to form their own regiment, those in the wanting to join the Union Army ended up joining uh, other Maryland units, even uh, Pennsylvania and Delaware regiments. For example, uh, Robert E. Duvall joined Company A of Cornell Legion Cavalry down in Baltimore. And there's an interesting article about um, Captain Duvall riding off to uh, Baltimore. It was published in the National American, which again was the Bel Air newspaper that was pro-Union. It says, on Monday last, as Captain Duvall of Harford County was riding down the Harford Turnpike to join his regiment of cavalry and passing a public school when the pupils were at play, they immediately ran to the roadside to greet him, shouting, Hurrah for the Union. The captain, taking his cap off, instantly returned the compliment by saying, God bless you, by you, my young friends. May the flag of the country wave forever. It was indeed a beautiful sight to see those patriotic scions of their glorious country, animated by fervent love for its maintenance, rush so spontaneously to salute one of its defenders. It must have made the captain's heart beat high with 
patriotic emotion to have been so greeted by the youthful and loyal patriots. Interesting enough, uh, the last time we mentioned Herman Stump, he had fled to Canada to avoid arrest. But through the help of his family, the Department of State decided that Herman Stump could return back to Hartford County. Uh, the description in the official record book was that uh, Herman Stump was an ardent advocate of the rebel cause in Hartford County, Maryland, and was attached to a volunteer military association recruiting and getting under discipline there with a view to entering the rebel service. Apprehending arrest, he fled in August 1861 to Canada. In January 1862, the Secretary of War gave assurance to Stump that he would not be molested on his return home by any authority of the government unless he shall commit some offense hereafter which may make his arrest necessary. So this allowed Herman Stump to return to Harford County. Now, I mentioned before, Harford County uh, had slavery. Uh, and as an example of what was going on in Harford County during the Civil War, this article appeared in the National American that said that the, there was going to be a sheriff's sale of a Negro woman on the courthouse steps. And it apparently was a a young girl, 20 years old, who was a free um, African-American who got caught in the vagrancy laws, and as a result, she was sentenced to be sold into slavery for one year. There was other slavery issues in Harford County by May of 1862. Washington, D.C., in April, had... Uh, abolished slavery, and that meant that many slaves now in Maryland could escape not only to Pennsylvania and north of the Mason-Dixon line, but also now south to Washington, D.C. Interestingly enough, though, some slave owners in Maryland began to see that as possibly something good because they blamed the Union soldiers for making the slaves insubordinate and virtually worthless for work. As an example, Mrs. Griffith uh, who also had, in addition to slaves, also had African-American servants, wrote, Lizzie, quite insolent to me this morning, Mr. G or Mr. Griffin threatened to have her whipped. I said she should leave. She is very troublesome and can do very well when she pleases. Now, we, interesting enough, we also have some uh, accounts of what Harford County looked like to the Union soldiers who were in Harford County protecting Haverty Grace, the railroad bridges throughout the area. And this one was from a New York soldier, a young soldier. And he wrote his parents, particularly the most important part of the line is that um, everything is very quiet at present, more so than usual as the weather is getting mildly hot and we are giving up drilling but an hour in a day, just enough for exercise. The rest of the time, the boys are out amongst the farmers. Some go and help them hoe and everything to get acquainted. And through their good behavior, the folks are getting quite a liking to the boys. There were incidents, though, in Harford County. June 3rd, National American had a letter in there that apparently someone uh, burned the flag of the Dublin post office. And the letter written in response to that was, we will make a liberal reward for the apprehension of the hell-born rebel wretch who destroyed the flag of our country on the night of the 3rd by cutting it down from our flag staff. But as the war grew, the need for volunteers continued. And President Lincoln called for another 300,000 volunteers to serve three years. Each state was issued a quota based upon its population, and each state then uh, poured that quota to the individual counties, how much each county would have to provide to meet that requirement. At the same time, uh, the Lincoln administration raised the federal income tax rate to help pay for the war. So two things that were 
unpopular, particularly with the Southern sympathizers in Harford County, was trying to get more volunteers and also uh, paying more taxes. One of the first Harford Countyans to die in the military portion of the um, campaign was Isaac P. Webster. He was the youngest son of Captain John Adams Webster, Rachel Webster, at Mount Adams Farm uh, near Creswell. And the house that they lived in still stands down there on, on Route 543. Isaac was their youngest son. And uh, according to the National American article, he died of camp fever, uh, which is meaning he died, died of disease. Now, most of the American deaths uh, on both sides, Confederate and Union, were from disease. It was by far the most deadly um, aspect of soldier soldiering at the time. Now, in addition to volunteers, Lincoln also called for 300,000 militia. The difference between a volunteer and a militia is obviously by the name. Uh, the volunteer is someone who volunteers to serve in the military. The militia can be someone who is drafted. And also, generally, the militia uh, units that are formed tend to stay in the state that they are organized in. So as you can see, on the what the Secretary of War ordered was that a draft of 300,000 militia be immediately called into the service of the United States to serve for nine months unless sooner discharged. And that if any state shall not by the 15th of August furnish its quota of the additional 300,000 volunteers authorized by law, the deficiency of volunteers in the state will also be made up by a special draft from the militia. So they came up with a complicated equation that each three-year volunteer counted for four nine-month militia, uh, which was confusing to everybody even then. But it also, uh, they provided an, an exemption that you could buy a, uh, an exemption by paying a cash uh, bounties to avoid the draft. Now, Mrs. Griffith wrote in her diary, to serve in the Yankee army against their beloved South, intense excitement on consequence, many leaving for parts unknown. Uh, in other words, many perhaps fled to Canada or some other state. To prevent those from fleeing, though, the the Union um, commander in Maryland uh, passed several directors uh, down from the uh, Secretary of War, including that no citizen liable to be drafted into the militia shall be allowed to go to a foreign country. So in other words, you couldn't flee to Canada. Uh, any person liable to draft who shall absent himself from his country or state before such draft is made will be arrested. The writ of habeas corpus is hereby suspended in respect to all persons so arrested and detained in respect to all persons arrested for disloyal practices. Now, the most dangerous one is that all U.S. Marshals and superintendents or chiefs of police of any town, city, or district be and they are hereby authorized and directed to arrest and imprison any person or persons who may be engaged by act, speech, or writing in discouraging volunteer enlistments or in any way giving aid and comfort to the enemy or in any other disloyal practice against the United States. So in other words, even if a parent tried to talk their son out of uh, enlisting, they could be arrested. As I said before, uh, Harford County didn't have enough um, soldier possibilities for a full regiment of about 1,000 people. But uh, one of the regiments being formed in Maryland, the 7th Maryland Regiment, two of its companies, and each company is about 100 soldiers, uh, were recruited in Harford County. The recruiting office in Bel Air was operated by 2nd Lieutenant Richard E. Bolden who was the son of the Harford County Sheriff and editor of the National American. The regiment itself was under Colonel Edwin H. Webster, who was Harf from Harford County and uh, also was the congressman 
uh, for uh, Harford County. Within three days, it said 47 recruits left for Camp Hartford down by Baltimore, which uh, was the former cattle showgrounds of the agricultural fair. An example of one was William A. Hawkins. He walked to Hope Crosswells, which was level, took a wagon to Aberdeen, and then took the train to Baltimore, his first time in his life he ever did that. He was given a physical, a uniform, and issued a musket. The papers also called for help from women, not just uh, male soldiers. National American uh, mo mentioned uh, how women could help the war effect by visiting hospitals, providing clothing, and helping the wounded. And said, let them be sure that in so doing, they are playing not a small unimportant part in this great tragedy. And let them expect the gratitude of the whole army and of the whole country. Now, preparing for the draft in Hartford County required several steps. Uh, for example, uh, they needed an examining surgeon uh, to determine who was physically handicapped and could, and could not uh, serve. Uh, that was Dr. Samuel Ramsey. Uh, William H. Uh, Dallum was appointed the commissioner to supervise enrollment in the militia draft. And this interesting article in the National American said, uh, we are told that threats are made to resist the draft. We would inform those who entertain this idea that preparations will be made to put down all attempts at insubordination in the most summary manner. Some of the persons who have made the threats are known and will be attended to at the proper time. Now I want to jump back a little bit again to some of the Union soldiers uh, in Harford County guarding the bridges because this was kind of an interesting um, quote from the chaplain of one of the units. Uh, this kind of state the missions of how these soldiers looked at Harford County. It said the railroad and telegraph communications had been several times interrupted and danger was still imminent. Maryland yet swarmed with disloyalists, watching every opportunity to bring dishonor and ruin upon the national cause. And but for the vigilance of the government, this important line of communication with the North would have been seriously, perhaps fatally interrupted. And apparently the threat to the bridges was serious, particularly uh, during the September, uh, what was called the Maryland Campaign, that's the one that resulted uh, in the Battle of Antietam in, in 1862. There was enough concern in Washington, D.C. at the, the senior level that um, they were notified uh, by uh, Samuel Felton, who owned the railroad line running through uh, Harford County, that uh, people at the Navy Yard strongly advised use of gunboats as most efficient at Susquehanna, Bush, and Gunpowder Rivers. These would make everything there safe. Can you do anything to help me get them? They should be light draught, telegraph answered, and inform there are plenty at Washington. So already, at the strategic level, the importance of those railroad bridges to the Union war effect was recognized by the Lincoln administration. Now, the Battle of Antietam itself took place on September 17, 1862, an extremely bloody conflict. Um, one of the Harford Countyans uh, who was killed at Antietam was Philip R. Spicer. And you can see he was one of the Union soldiers who enlisted in the 1st Delaware Regiment. He was born in Harford County. He was 26 years old. He was a real right. He's buried in Antietam National Cemetery. You can see his grave there. In October 1862, the, the militia draft finally occurred. Uh, again, you can look at the, the uh, complicated mathematical equation used to figure out how many people Harford County needed to draft. From the, the apportionment of 664, they were able to find 423 volunteers, so they only had to draft 204. Uh, everyone who is drafted um, gets their name in the newspaper. Uh, you can see the uh, Aegis description of the draft, which was, according to the order of the government, the commissioner, 
uh, Hall proceeded on Wednesday last to make the draft. The drawing was done by a small boy, blindfolded, and the work was soon completed and created but little excitement. Many persons supposed that there would be a large collection of people to witness the drafting, but such was not the case. There were but few people in attendance. The entire draft was 204. Those who were drafted were ordered to report to Havre de Grace on October 25th, and then they would be moved down to Baltimore, uh, Camp Bradford, by October 28th. Substitutes were accepted for those not willing to serve, but you had to pay uh, $300 to $700 to obtain those substitutes. Again, I'll check back again with some of the Union soldiers who were guarding the railroad bridges in December of 1862. Um, by then, uh, it had been boring. There had been no attacks against the bridges uh, in 1862. So they're mainly doing training, guard duty. Uh, interesting last line there, on guard duty every other day and night. Much sympathy in this vicinity for the South. Railroads are kept well guarded. James Archer, now a Brigadier General in the Confederate Army in Virginia, had recently just participated in the Battle of Fredericksburg, which was the enormous victory for the Confederates and a disastrous, costly defeat for the Union Army. He began to think maybe the war could be won in the East. In a letter to his brother, dated January 2nd, 1863, he wrote, All were here. The prospects, I think, look bright for peace since the Battle of Fredericksburg and since the Democrats in the North have found their tongue. A victory in the West, I think, would settle the matter. This is where part one ends. Uh, part two, we're going to look at what goes on in 1863, 1864, and 1865, which will change a lot in Harford County and also bring the war home to Harford County. Thank you, Jeff. We hope you have enjoyed this presentation on Harford County's role in the Civil War from 1860 to 1862. Please join us for part two, looking at the years 1863 to 1865. That presentation will be available beginning September 29, 2020 at www.harvardhistory.org. For more information on Harford County and the Civil War, read the Harford Historical Bulletin articles authored by Jeff Smart, including a three-part series on the Civil War in Harford County during 1861, a two-part series on Harford County in the Civil War in 1862, and Part 1 of Harford County in the Civil War in 1863. Jeff has also written A History of Edgewood Arsenal in World War I. You can purchase copies of these and other Harford Historical Bulletins through the Society's bookstore on our website. Finally, Plan to join us on October 13th for a live webinar conversation with Jeff Smart about Harford County in the Civil War. You will have the chance to ask your questions and hear Jeff answer them live. Feel free to submit your questions in advance at virtual at harfordhistory.org. You may register for the October 13th question and answer session through www harfordhistory.org. Thank you and please join us again for part two available September 29th and for the question and answer session on October the 13th.